out on my morning walk all rugged up, and when I was back from my morning walk, walk half of it was off because it's not that cold. <laughs> I'm just kidding for everyone said in Vitago will be very, very cold. I'm sure it does get cold. This morning we have come together to look at natural remedies. And natural remedies have almost been lost, haven't they? And the first natural remedy that I was introduced to was an onion poppice. See, I was getting very frustrated. I think I mentioned my first daughter, Emma, had an earache. And even though I was in the back to nature, I didn't know anything about natural remedies. And everyone said, don't play with the ears, she'll go deaf. Now, I just want to write something up on the board, where are my pencils there now? Now, we should never make a decision according to fear. Mm -hmm. And so when people said to me, if you don't do something about your daughter's earache, she'll go deaf. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know. See, many are th sick through ignorance, and I was ignorant. I, I didn't know what to do to ears. But what we should make decisions on is this fact. So, four courses of antibiotics later, and six weeks later, guess what came back? The earache. She got on the antibiotics. Within 24 hours of finishing the antibiotic, the earache had come back. I was so frustrated. Because what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results. So I went to the doctor and I said, as he's writing the fifth script for antibiotics, I said, I have a question. I said, will my daughter be on antibiotics for the rest of her life? Am I coming to that conclusion? He was challenged by my question. He said, I'll give you a referral to an ear, nose and throat specialist. The ear, nose and throat specialist looked in Emma's ears, looked in her mouth and said, the child's teeth. Give her these drops to keep the eustachian tubes clear. You know, the eustachian tubes are the tubes that connect your ears and your nose and your eyes. That was it. So 18 months later, I have another baby who gets an earache. And I did not go to the doctor this time. I went to the old lady next door. I was 25, she was 85. She said, well, I said to her, what did your mother do when you were a little girl and you had an earache? She said, mum would steam up an onion on the stove. So I ran home, I steamed an onion on the stove, I cut it in half around, so you're looking at the rings, I wrapped it in a cloth, I put it on my son James' ear. He was only 18 months at the time. He was breastfeeding, so I could do anything to him. He fell asleep and he slept for two hours. What did that tell you? He's got relief. When he woke up, he was happy. I watched him all day. I watched him all the next day. <laughs> my first husband said, I'm sure, I'm, whenever he cried, he said, I'm sure it's that ear, you know, you didn't get any antibiotics because we both knew it. So I went to the doctor with a happy little boy. I said, I'd just like you to look in his ears. The ear that had the earache was totally clear. The other earache had a bit of wax in it. He said, there's nothing wrong with your son's ears. Oh, I was so happy. I was 25 and that was my first experience with natural remedies. I bought a little book that had an index in it. And under E, I put onion poultice. So I'd like to show you how to do the onion poultice. Now we're going to pretend, and God gave us imagination, we're going to pretend that I have just steamed or dry baked this onion. Don't boil it in water because some of the healing properties will go into the water. Question? Doesn't have to be a red onion, can be any onion. I, th I think my communication got mixed up. I think they thought I meant a red onion, but you can do any onion. You can do a white onion, you can do a brown onion, and it must be steamed or dry baked. And then it is cut in half. So you see the rings. And then what you can do is you can squeeze it. It'll be boiling hot, but the juice will go into the 
cool spoon and that'll cool it down a little bit and then that can be poured into the ear. That's something that I have since learned. And then you wrap the onion in a cloth and it's nice to have a great big cloth. Um, Jeremy, can you come up and sit here for me? Um, Jeremy has kindly agreed to be my patient and I've assured him he will survive the experience. So depending on how hot it is, and it will be boiling, you put it on your, your arm to just test if it's, if it's the right temperature. And then you can cover it with a piece of wool square, which is what they did in the old days. Or you can cover it with a piece of plastic. I use the glad wrap and I just fold it over a few times and that makes it a little thicker and a little bit more workable. So you've got basically a thick bit there. Then you've got your onion here. And then we, let's say Jeremy's left ear has got an ache, then you put it on the ear like this. Now what you can do, you can bandage it around the, ear, the head like that and that'll bandage quite nicely around and keep it, keep it on there. Or you, sometimes people will put a little woolly beanie on that, that's quite snug. And what would happen if Jeremy did have an earache? That will bring a lot of relief. And ideally, you lay him down on a soft pillow with his head on, on it. And it won't hurt because the onion is, remember, nice and soft now. And the pillow will take it in a little bit. And it will keep it nice and warm. See, what you want is to keep this warm. The longer it's kept warm, you can keep it on. If this onion goes cold, then that would increase the ache. What onion does is it, is it uh, absorbs poisons and it's a drawer. So it will draw out of the out of the ear. Now if Jeremy had an infection the other side of the eardrum, then the body would make a little hole in the eardrum and the pus would come out of the, out of the ear. Not a problem. If the body makes a hole, guess what? The body will heal the hole. But if you poke a needle into your eardrum, it's a, no, you're in problem. If the body does it, remember the body knows what to do. It can heal itself. Sometimes there's no need to make a hole in the eardrum. And if there's no need, well, the body won't. And sometimes the body can just take the waste away through the bloodstream, the lymphatic system bloodstream. So that is a cooked onion poultice. Now let's say Jeremy had a, a boil on his arm. Let's say he's got a, a boil on his arm here. You can put, not the same one of course, a fresh one. You can put, put the um, cooked onion poultice on his arm and then bandage that on. Now because um, Jeremy's just uh, seven, this is probably an overkill the size of this onion. We probably need a smaller onion and make a smaller poultice. But what do you do for the board? You just leave it on. You can even leave it on for quite a long time. The plastic will keep it warm. And when you take it off, often all the waste will come out. So not only does the onion poultice um, remedy the problem by pulling the waste out, but it also brings great relief. In fact, a friend of mine, he used to do the onion poultice for his, his children, and they were travelling one day in the car, and his, his son, who was only six at the time, he yelled out, Dad, I need an onion! He had a new He said, we're travelling, so I went to a restaurant, and I said, uh, excuse me, can I just buy an onion? Because it was evening. The guy said, yeah, brought it out, and he goes, um, would you mind microwaving it for me? And I said, righto. So he microwaved it and brought it out, and the guy had a cloth for it. And the guy in the restaurant said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to put it on my, my son's ear. He's got an ear. Up. The guy never heard anything like it. Now, microwaving's not the best, but you know what? In a crisis, you do what you can. So cooked onion for earache and for boil. They're the two main places you do the cooking for boil. So the next one I'm going to look at is we're going to use um, 
raw onion. And this poultice that I'm about to do is a poultice that you do for a congested chest and you even a congested head of any sort. And you chop the onion up in little pieces and you put it in a plastic bag and you put it on the foot. Jeremy, would you mind taking your sock and your shoe off for me, please? I'll just do it on one foot. But of course, usually you would do it on both feet. Now, I've seen this have remarkable effects many times. I was with my daughter and her little three-year-old was coughing. He had a, a bad cold. And he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed. She put him to bed and we thought he'll go to sleep in a minute. But he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed. And after an hour I said, we'll put an onion poultice on his feet. So can you see I've just got the onion in the plastic bag. And this is what we did. We put the, can you put your foot up really high? Thanks. So everyone can see that. You just put the foot in the bag on top of the onion and then twist the, twist the bag round and round and then you put the sock on and the sock will hold it in place. It's a nice stretchy sock, that's what we want. See how that will hold it in place and, the, and just check that the onion's all on the bottom of the foot. Now that won't be very comfortable to walk on but you put, do it just before they go to bed and that will never blister or hurt the skin. Anyway, we did it to my little grandson, and it's almost unbelievable, not one more cough. And he'd been coughing for one hour. And we put the onion on the bottom of his foot, and he slept the <coughs> night. I'm just warning women, if you do this, your husband won't like the perfume. <laughs> but hey, hey, it's worth it. So, for congestion, you know, in the sinuses, in the head, in the chest, it's such a simple thing to do. Um, it's just the onion on the feet. You can even do it every night and it will not hurt or blister the feet. Now I'm going to do something else that you can do with a raw onion and that is make a onion syrup. And to make the onion syrup, we chop up onion and you layer it with honey. So you do... Um, a little bit much. You do about a centimetre of onion and then you do about a teaspoon of honey over the onion. I'm doing this one early in our demo because by the end of the meeting you will see a syrup form. Now usually you keep the your onion in the in the syrup for 24 hours. After 24 hours you can strain it. And it will keep in the fridge that onion syrup indefinitely. Now the sky's the limit as to what you can do with this. You can um, add ginger, you can add a bit of garlic if you like. But mostly I just do the onion and right now I'm experiencing a little bit of tingling in my eyes and that actually in itself shows you the effect that onion has on the respiratory. It has the effect to actually cut the mucus. So if you've got a cold, cut up an onion and breathe in deeply. Got another layer of, of um, onion there, and then another spoonful of honey. I do this a bit when I'm cooking too. I I just measure. I mean, I don't measure. I guess. 
so it's, it's whatever. So we've got another layer of onion there and we'll do another um, spoonful of honey. And then the last layer of onion. Now, honey, as we know, is sort of very thick and sticky. And when the syrup forms, it's not thick and sticky, it's quite clear and runny, almost like water. I was asked the question in a meeting, how long does this onion syrup last? And my answer was, I don't know, because it doesn't last long with my children. Lady in the meeting one day that I was giving, she was a German lady, and she said, I've had a jar in my fridge for eight years. Because, as we know, honey doesn't go off. So that's filled my jar. And basically, if we had a huge jar, we put more in. And you might like to just turn it up for a little bit so that the honey all falls down for a few minutes and then I'll turn it upright and by the end of the meeting you'll see the clear liquid formed and we'll bring it tomorrow and you can all have a taste. I have made this syrup with raw honey that was solid. You can still do that because within an hour or two your, your syrup is starting to form. So what's the dosage for an adult? They could have a teaspoon three times a day for a child. You might give half a teaspoon three times a day. For a little baby, you might give just a few drops. So just depending on the age. If um, a child had a bad cough of an evening, and if a child or anyone has a bad cough, they will find that if they don't eat an evening meal, they won't cough as much in the night. So not to eat an evening meal, um, it is best to have, you know, the main meal in the middle of the day. But I used to, uh, with my children, if they had a cold, they would eat very lightly, just soups and fruit. That's, that's all that's necessary. And a lot of children, they would stop eating. People say to me, my child's not eating. I say, good. That's really good. <laughs> and I've heard to go very lightly for a couple of days. So that's what you can do with onion. You can make an onion syrup. Um, turn it up now. Yeah. And you can chop up the onion and put it on the bottom of the feet. Again, it will never hurt the feet. And you can also um, <coughs> cook it for the, for the boil and for the ear. Now we're going to have a look at garlic which is a relative of the onion. And this garlic is one of the most potent, well, it's the most potent antibiotic. In fact, the research shows, shows that it's six times more potent than tetracycline. To take it as an antibiotic, you would need to take three to four raw cloves a day. Now, not, not everyone can handle that. And some people can't handle the raw garlic very well because uh, it's very high in sulphur, so if someone has a stomach ulcer, it could um, burn it a little bit. But if you have a bowl of hot soup and crush the garlic straight into the hot soup minutes before you eat it, that will take the edge off. And because it's been eaten with the soup that's got veggies and maybe some lentils in it, the stomach can often handle that a little bit better. But it's very potent. Now, I always look for this when I by garlic, see the purple? And I always look for Australian. A lot of garlic, most garlic that's coming from China has been irradiated. So look for your tiny little cloves. The tiny cloves are usually very, very potent. So we're going to pretend that uh, Jeremy's only two. He's a lot bigger than two, as you can see. But we're going to pretend that he's two. And two-year-olds don't usually like much raw garlic. And I'm going to do to, to Jeremy what I've done to many babies. You can do it even to a newborn baby that's got a congested head or chest.
cold, you can slice up the garlic and wrap it on the bottom of their feet. So you'll need a little cloth like this. If you put the garlic straight onto the bottom of the feet, it will blister. So you need to have a little cloth there between the garlic and the bottom of the feet. And what I do is I finely slice it. Now this is a, this remedy, when I first came across it, I said it was a remedy for whooping cough. So any type of chest problem. So you've got the cloth there and you lay the slices of garlic like that. About three, maybe if it's a little baby, you'd only put two there. And then you put the cloth over it like that. So you've got cloth between the garlic and the child's foot. I have done it many times and it will never blister if you do it like that. So we're going to put it on Jeremy's foot. It's coming out a bit, so we'll push it in. And you just wrap it around like that. And then put the sock on. So that's it. That's very easy, isn't it? And if it's a little baby, then you put <coughs> put a booty over it, and that will hold it in place. You do it with both feet? Yes, you do. Mm. Both feet. Now it takes one minute for one drop of blood to go around the whole body. So within, um, and Jeremy might mind if you come and smell his breath. I'm sorry, I'm just joking. But you will find that within a couple of minutes, Jeremy's breath will smell of garlic. Now what will that garlic on the bottom of the feet do? The, the feet are a reflex for the head, the chest and the abdomen. So if Jeremy had a chest cold, that, uh, the blood would take the garlic to the chest. Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. Medicine calls it synergism. So the herbs work with the needs of the body. So. The body knows what to do. It says, oh good, we've got some garlic. We need it right here. Or we need it right here or right here. <laughs> and so that's an easy way to get garlic into, into a child. So you can do it overnight. I know my son James often used to have a chesty cold and I would wrap it on his feet and he'd run outside to play. You know, every step he's taking is a little bit more garlic going in. Now, if I were to crush that garlic, the juice would come out too fast, even with the cloth there, and could harm the bottom of the feet. But the beauty of the slices is that just little by little by little it gets taken into the body. At the end of the day, I would take James' shoes and socks off, and I would take his garlic poultice off, and the garlic was like bits of dried out yellow leather. There wasn't any juice left in it, and the body had, had taken it away. So that's an easy way to give garlic to a baby, a toddler. Thanks. Now what, what I used to do, having six then eight children, there was lots of sheets that wore out. And so I, as I have done here, we used to cut up old sheets. What The next thing I'm going to look at is um, a castor oil compress. And a castor oil compress can be applied to different parts of the body for different reasons. Castor oil is an oil that penetrates deeper than any other oil. And wherever castor oil penetrates, it breaks up lumps, bumps, congestions, adhesions. So let me show you how it's made. So you need to have several thicknesses. See, I've got quite a few thicknesses there. And you have a plastic backing. This is what I do. And then you pour the castor oil on. Now, castor oil is very, very thick, as you will see. So I put it on, and the reason I'm putting it on early in our lecture is because that's going to take a little while to soak in. So I cannot hold that up for you. But you might see that it's just sitting on top. And notice that I've just covered about a third 
of the area. So we're going to let that just sit because it will soak in. <coughs> By the time we'll have a little bit of a break halfway through our demo this morning, you can come and see. See, if you were to put that on right now, the oil would just splat everywhere. So you need to do it about half an hour before you're going to apply it and allow it little by little to soak in. Where would you apply the castor oil? It will break up a bone spur. That's probably the hardest thing it can break up. If the bone spur has been there three years, it might take three months of application to break up the spur. If the bone spur has been there three months, it may take three weeks of application to break it up. So it all depends how long it has been there. So just keep applying it little by little. Will the castor oil break up a bone? No, it will not. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. Basically, the castor oil just works with the needs of the body. It goes where it needs to. And a bone spur is an unnatural formation. It's a calcium deposit that's built up on the body. So the castor oil can break that down. Also, it can be used for, um, for cataracts. One drop of castor oil in the eye. Now, I guess have told me very difficult to do that. And so here's an easy way to do it. You just put castor oil on your finger and you just wipe it over your eye and your eyelashes and you blink and it will penetrate through the eyelid and it will also come a little bit in through the lashes. A lady got back to me. She said she'd be doing it for six months and she went back to the doctor and she said the doctor couldn't believe it. My cataracts are actually reducing. That's with the castor oil. Now, if it's not going to do it, you've lost nothing. Very, very safe. So you can use it for cataracts, you can use it for um, bone spurs, you can also apply it to the abdomen for constipation. It'll penetrate very, very deep and break up congestion there. I met a lady who cured her irritable bowel with castor oil compresses. So this is probably not a big enough compress, I won't hold it up because it's still going everywhere. It will go everywhere. That's probably not a big, big enough compress for, for me. That would be a nice size for Jeremy. So for a, um, a chest, and, it, and you can apply it to the chest, and it will break up congestion in the chest. So for the chest, you probably want an area about that big to apply to the chest. For the abdomen, an area maybe about that big. So when you apply it to the abdomen, it's hip to hip, belly bone to pubic bone, that's about the area. And then you always cover it with plastic. What plastic does is it keeps it from spoiling your clothes. Also keeps it warm and prevents chilling. I was asked, what did they do in the old days before plastic? Well, in one old book said they used oiled silk. And another old book said they just used woolen squares, so you can use either. And as you'll notice with this, I won't hold it up, but you'll notice in other ones that I do that you make the plastic a little bit bigger than the, than the poultice. I wanted to set that up so that by the break you can see what that does. Did you say how long you leave it on? How long would you leave it on for? At least five hours a day. Some people wear it overnight, some people would prefer to just put it in their clothes and wear it through the day. I told the story of the lady last night, the doctor from South Australia, whose lump in her breast had reduced one by one centimetre in one month using castor oil. And what is very handy is to get a little panty liner, it's very, very absorbent and it's got plastic backing. Put the castor oil on that and again you apply it and you just leave it there. You just leave it there for half an hour, an hour, and just slowly let it, let it soak in. And then, she, and then a woman just puts it in her bra. Now, because it's not drawing anything out of you, it's just a vehicle. It's just a vehicle to hold the oil so that it can go into you. So about every 24 hours, maybe 36 hours, you might put a little bit more castor oil on. You'll get to know uh, what it, when it's starting to feel a little bit dry. If you put too much on, you're going to get castor oil dripping everywhere and that is no fun at all. So you, you'll get to know. Uh, necessity is the mother of every invention. 
And this lecture is all about that. Necessity being another invention. <laughs> Question. Um, earlier, when you put the onion and the glad wrap on the wee boy's um, foot, how does the onion go through the glad wrap to go into the body? Um, it wasn't. I, I put the onion in the bag. I put his foot in the bag. Oh, on top of the actual onion. So his foot is sitting on the onion. Ah, sorry, I didn't quite. No, I love a question. So Thank please you. ask. When would you use a garlic? Um, thing, or an onion one. I noticed you did both, and you mentioned they both for um, congestion. Yeah. But when would you use which one? Well, you know what you do. You try onion one night. You try garlic one night, and you see what what has the, the so best. So they both the same. Uh, the onion seems to be the best for the cough. That, that's what that's what I have found. The onion on the bottom. Of the foot. <coughs> yeah. Please ask a question. Um, so we could do pulsing with the um, veggies and whatnot. You know, to keep the heat in, could you use a wheat bag to, you know, keep the heat up? You know, so if it was to go cold, I'd put a wheat bag on. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, to help you, keep the you heat. could try that, yeah. But if you have it well covered with plastic and then wool, and the body heat will, yeah, it, it often will, but, but you, could, you could try that. Also, with castor oil, um, So you can use it uh, to break up gallstones. You can use it to break up uh, kidney stones. I've had people use it on sore, inflamed knees. As we go through this, you'll see there's a few poultices that you can use. You just try one one day, see what it does. Try another one the next day, and, and you'll, you'll see which one your body likes. And the other is that they do slightly different things, so you can you can alternate the poultices. So the onion, once it's used, you would not use it again. The garlic, once it's used, you would not use it again. They're drawing waste out of the body. But the castor oil, I, I call it more compress. Remember, it's a vehicle to hold the oil so that it goes in, into you. Excuse me, but it helps also dry eye. Yes. 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 Something else helps dry eyes, and I'll give you the recipe for it. And it's a tea, and it's eye bright and golden seal tea. So it's half a teaspoon of eye bright herb, and you can you can buy the eye bright herb from the health food shop. One tea, and half a teaspoon of golden seal. Golden seal has a nickname. The nickname is King of Tonics to all mucous membranes. So golden seal can be used for urine tract infection. It can be used for inflammation in the gut. Wherever there's mucus, golden seal can be used. But in this case, we're using it in the eye. So sore eyes, dry eyes, inflamed eyes. And to those two herbs, you add one cup of boiling water. And you let that sit till it cools. Then you strain it. And you bathe the eye. You buy you buy a little eye bath. You put it in the tea in the eye bath and you just bathe the eye with it. Eye bright is an interesting herb. That that herb is used for all eye problems, no matter no matter what the eye problem is. Yes, you use that. A lot of eyes deteriorate because they don't get used. And glasses can make eyes lazy. Barbara? Yeah? Um, would the castor oil um, pulses be useful for hernia? Um, you can try with the hernia. Hernia, that is one area where really you really need an operation because it's the two muscles have split. Yep. And even if you bind it together, guess what happens every time you laugh, you cough, you yeah. <laughs> go to the bathroom, you strain it all, and it's a very simple operation. It's just the two muscles being stitched together. So yep. um, that, that usually. 
See, this is starts to run everywhere. You have to keep your eye on it. If this table's not totally flat. So that's where you can use castor oil. And that is a little additive on uh, on for eyes. So you could bathe the eyes with that a couple of times a day and then put the castor oil in after even after you bathe bathe the eyes. Yes. Can I ask you about the um, uh, castor oil? Uh, after someone's had a renal operation, you know, can you still apply the castor oil just to help repair? You know, could. That's a very good question because um, castor oil can break up uh, scar tissue. And when a person's had operations, there's usually a lot of scar tissue there. And the scar tissue can cause other problems. But the castor oil can help to break that, the, the scar tissue up. So that will help the renal operation afterwards? Yeah. Certainly would. Um, I've also had people tell me that for skin cancers, they've just put a dot of castor oil on every day. And it has helped with skin cancers. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Cancema or Black Salve. It's a cream that was developed in the world using the herb blood root, and it can eat out cancer cells. We, we, we have it at Mr. Mountain. After the black salve has been applied and it, it can eat out the cancer cell, then castor oil can be applied after that. If you put black salve or cancema into the web, you'll find out. But the first few pictures you'll see are the most terrible pictures because when you apply back black salve to a skin cancer and you get a reaction, that's a, that's a sign that it was cancer because if there's no cancer there there'll be no reaction. So we apply the pie just a dot of the black cell, put tape over it and leave it for 24 hours. And then when you take it off, it looks terrible. It's all red, pussy inside. Guests say to me, Barbara, look at it. I say, fantastic. Excuse me, you said black salve. S A L V E salve. So you'll go to the web and you'll see the most horrific pictures and it'll say, this is dangerous. Now, if you go to a website advertising for, uh, say, a nose operation, do they have photographs of the person just after they've come out of the operation? What will they look like? Black! So, do you see what I mean? It, the, the photos have come up to scare people that this is terrible. And we had a guy last program who we put it on and oh, I had this big red lump, all red and pussy. And I said, just, just don't do it before you go to a wedding. But you know what it's doing? It's doing an operation. It's, it's, it's just eating out the cancer cell. The beauty of this cream is it'll search out the roots and eat out the roots. But I say, if someone says to you, what have you done? Just say, I've just had a skin cancer burnt out. Now, that is the truth, because this black cell is burning out the cancer. But if you had a skin cancer burnt out at the doctor, it would look like that, wouldn't it? But you see what I mean? No one blinks at that. But it's, that's what it does. Is there a question? So do you buy this in the shop, or do you no. have to... No, it's very hard to get because the pharmaceutical companies don't like it because it works. But Misty Mountain sell it. So if you bring up Misty Mountain, we'll post it to you. We don't have an online shop. Okay. Uh, we do have an online shop, but we don't sell that. They tried to ban it in America and the judge threw it out of court. He just laughed. <laughs> so we could get it off you? You could. Every home should have one. You'll get a tiny little jar. It'll be about $100, but you know what? It, you'll, that you'll have it forever. So all you do is put a tiny, just a little dot on it and cover it. And then, like a pinhead. Pardon? Like, say, like a pinhead? Ah, uh, yeah, a little bit more than a pit head. Maybe the size of a sesame seed. You just put, put a little bit on there. What's the difference between blubber and paste and the black side? No. Oh, so they're the same. I thought blubber was weaker. Oh, I mean, um, you can actually find the recipe on the, on the web, and there are a few other things in the black cell, but the main ingredient is um, blood root. In the New Zealand Health House in Tower, there's a sort of blood root, but then recently they sent one to certain 
stores that you can get from the store. Thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the and uh, you, a lady used to sell it in a town near us, and she got away with it because she said not for human use, only for dogs. Mm -hmm. But she's not allowed to even do that now. Wow. But it's um, it's very powerful, and it can eat out cancer cell. That's why if you've got a big cancer, I would be very cautious because if you put too much on, you'll get a huge reaction, and it'll be very painful. But I, I'm very happy to coach people through. I'm going to go back to garlic before we move on. And I'm going to give you a recipe for a flu bomb. And this flu bomb does exactly what it says in its name. It'll bomb a flu. And the first thing, so it's a flu bomb. And when a person has the flu, or a chest cold, or bronchitis, or any type of respiratory, they take the flu bomb three times a day. And it's one clove of garlic. Now, if Jeremy had a cold, and he agreed to have the flu bomb, we would probably use a tiny little clove of garlic. No, I can like in the middle you'll get tiny little cloves of garlic, but if it was me I'd use a great big clove of garlic. This bulb doesn't have any tiny ones. So um, depending on the age, depending on what the person can cope with, my husband could probably only cope with a small clove of garlic, but I can cope with a big clove. And you crush it or grate it. And then a quarter of a teaspoon of Ginger, finely chopped. And the third ingredient is one drop of eucalyptus oil. If you don't have eucalyptus oil, you can use um, tea tree oil and cane pepper. And I'm not going to put an amount on there. So. Jeremy could probably handle a light sprinkle. I could probably handle half a teaspoon, because I'm used to it. So, depends on what you can cope with. The next ingredient is the juice of a lemon. If lemons are out of season, you might just put a little bit in it. If lemons are in season and your tree's laden, you might put the juice of a whole lemon. The next ingredient is one teaspoon of honey. And then you add a little hot water to that. There's your flu bomb. And what that flu bomb does is it brings relief to all the symptoms of a bad chest cold, head cold, sinus, pneumonia. How much hot water do you put in? Well, you can put half a cup in. My daughter used to put a tiny little quarter of a cup because she said, I just want to get it over and done with very quickly. <laughs> So that's why it's um, whatever you want. So there's your flu bomb. And you just drink it down? You drink it. Down. Yes. Yeah. Now <coughs> ideally, um, you might drink that down just before you're having a bowl of soup because for some people all those heating herbs would make their stomach go, ouch. Mm -hmm. yeah. just, um, can you want to use like, just a sprinkle with it? Yeah, it's whatever you can handle. It's a pepper and a drink pepper. Yeah. Not chilli, cayenne. There's a difference. And ideally your cayenne pepper should be bright, bright orange. If it's brown, it's old. It's lost its spark. Whatever you can handle. How long does it take to um, have the effect to work? You'll get effect pretty quick. I had a friend visit and he said, Barbara, I've got a cold. Give me some herbs. He's looking at all my herbs. Mm. So I made him a flu bomb and he didn't ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> but it does bring relief. You'll find by the third day you won't even want to look at it, but by the third day you've, you've got great relief. So if you consider that um, doing the flu bomb, uh, the onion on the feet, um, eating very lightly, just hot soups, Getting rugged up and doing, going, running up hills and drinking lots of water, it, it can pass away. A lot of people have colds that hang around because they don't handle it right. You've got to 
have those windows open, fresh air. How many people lock, shovel the windows up so they're nice and warm, but they're really suffocating because there's no, no air. The next one we're going to look at is ginger. And ginger can be used externally and ginger can be used internally. Externally, it can be uh, taken for nausea. In fact, if you go to the health food shop and get sea sickness or car sickness tablets, it'll be just compressed ginger. So ginger's an excellent anti-nausea herb. Ginger's also a very potent herb for inflammation. Its cousin turmeric actually tops the, tops the list for inflammation though. And turmeric looks very similar to ginger except it's very bright orange. It's turmeric that gives that lovely colour to a lot of onion dishes. The turmeric tea though won't take the edge off nausea like the ginger will. And yet the turmeric is more potent at reducing inflammation than the ginger is. So ginger can be used internally for inflammation. It can be used internally to uh, help with nausea. It can be used internally to warm the body. If you go to Asia and have a massage, I don't know whether you ever have, in Bali and Thailand, after your massage they'll have a hot ginger tea for you which is lovely. My complaint is it's got sugar in it, and I prefer not to sugar in it. But it's, uh, it's very good for that internally. I met a lady, I was at a health seminar, and we had a break, and there were herb teas, and she had a little tiny grater and a little teapot, and she was grating ginger, and I said, aha, ginger tea. Because to make ginger tea, you just grate it and pour boiling water on it, and let it sit for about 10 minutes. She said, yes, she said, I'm an entertainer, I'm a singer. I was in Greece singing and I lost my voice. And a little Greek lady made me some fresh ginger tea and I sang that night. So she said, I, I always take the ginger with me. Very good for morning sickness. But here's a little tip for anyone who you know may suffer from morning sickness. It's often a magnesium deficiency. And person who's got a magnesium deficiency, um, they can take up to even 2,000 milligrams a day. That's 500 milligrams four times a day. And the magnesium I advise is magnesium citrate. It's the easiest magnesium to absorb. Sometimes women with morning sickness have been able to remedy it by visiting the osteopath and finding that maybe their spine is a little out. So there are a few things can be, that can be done for morning sickness. But now I want to show you how you can use ginger externally. And we're going to pretend that Jeremy's got bad arthritis in his wrist. And we're going to make a ginger poultice for his painful arthritic wrist. Where ginger is used as a poultice is all joint inflammation. In a minute I'm going to show you what can be used for tissue inflammation. But the ginger is used predominantly for joint inflammation. So again I'm making up a thick, a thick square. And I've got a square, a hot square. Now what you can use also which are these cloth wipes and you would cut that in half and the beauty of that is it's got little holes in it because after you've used the poultice you just throw it away. We had a lady at our, our retreat last program that had breast cancer and we were doing poultices on it and for something like breast cancer for a very tender area who doesn't want any more unnatural thing in I would only use a cloth. But if um, Jeremy had sprained his ankle, he's a young boy, and it's just on it on the outside, I might use one of those. But my preference is to use the natural fibre. Chucks did bring out a, a natural chucks, and it was made out of viscose, but I, I can't find it anymore. I don't think it was very popular. So to um, 
To make a ginger poultice, uh, we'll do the fine one. So you grate it. There's no need to um, peel the ginger. I would definitely advise washing the dirt off if there's dirt on it. that's on a handle. You may have seen them. I find them very handy. If I was making ginger tea, I'd just pour the boiling water over the grater and get all those little bits. Now you will see see the juice coming out that's quite wet and the beauty of making a poultice where you fold it over over and over so you make like a little parcel and you can see the moisture that's come out of that it's quite wet and it's the juice that will be that will penetrate into the through the skin to the joint and you'll see that there's that little bit of plastic around the edge. So I always make it, make the poultice a little bit smaller than the plastic. And the beauty of having that little bit of package on the back is that you're not going to have it dripping everywhere. And there's not, nothing worse than a dripping poultice. So that's quite wet. And we've got the plastic all around the edge. <coughs> Jeremy, I might get you to stand up here so that everyone can see and we'll bandage your poor arthritic wrist. It's got a poor sore wrist. <coughs> so let's say most of the pain is around here. So we'll put it on like that. And then we'll bandage it on. And it's very important to make sure the plastic covers the poultice. <coughs> now, if you see here, the plastic's coming up a little bit there, it's coming down a bit here. I always. Um, Go to great lengths to make sure the poultice is sitting right, that it's bandaged right, because there's nothing worse than leaking poultices. And because Jeremy's got just such a tiny little wrist with a lot of bandage on here, <laughs> this definitely won't come off. And I'm sure very soon we'll get to the end of this bandage. Then put it on. So can you see that it's very comfortable? There's no way that the air can get into the wet, which could chill it. And now I do something I always do to poultices. I pray. So we're going to pray for your poultice, Jeremy. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jeremy, and we pray that this ginger poultice will bring relief to his arthritic wrist. And thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So it can be a very simple Simple prayer, that's all it need, need be. Now, if um, Jeremy's wrist was arthritic and it was painful, within half an hour, the skin would be getting very hot. And I've had guests say to me, Barbara, it feels like my skin's burning. And I laugh, I say, it does, but it will not burn. And some guests say, I can't stand it. I said, well, if you can't stand it, you can take it off, but I promise you it will not burn your skin. Most people that have a sore arthritic wrist, the heat feels wonderful. Very, very nice. So, um, 
that's what you do. Now, some people who say to me, I, I can't bear the heat, I say, well, just take it off, that's fine. Even if it's on for half an hour, it'll make a difference. It appears that the ginger pulls the inflammation out of the joint to the skin. Because if we had this poultice on Jeremy, who actually hasn't got an arthritic wrist, for two hours he would not feel the heat. Isn't that interesting? So it's, it'll only, in fact, if it gets hot, that's a confirmation that you've got an inflamed joint. So how long would you suggest leaving it on? Now, if someone can't handle the hot skin, that's perfectly fine. I find that different mm -hmm. people can handle different temperatures. Um, if you can handle the heat, you can leave it on all night. I had one lady, and we... Thank you. I had one lady, and she... We put it on. We usually put it on, I guess... I'll go a few more, so if you just... <laughs> Um, we usually put it on our guests at 6 o'clock at night. And then if it gets too hot and they think they won't be able to sleep, we'll just take it off. But if they say, oh, no, it feels very nice, then they leave it on overnight. So I leave it with the person. One lady, I saw her in the late afternoon, she'd had it on all night and all day. Oh, no, she said, oh, I love it. She said, oh, I'm just going to keep it there. <laughs> she had it on for 24 hours. And then she did the steam bath and took it off of the steam bath. Now, if she went into the steam bath, whoa, that would feel really, really hot. If you've had a ginger poultice on and the skin's gone hot, you have a shower that night, it feels like the hot water's burning your skin. It's all right, because that way. But that's a sign that there is inflammation in this joint. One lady was so excited and it brought her so much relief that she wanted to wear it all the time. But after 24 hours, her skin was getting a little sensitive. So what I say is just wear it for about four or five hours a day. And the ginger getting sensitive on the skin, it's really not the ginger that's irritating the skin, it's the inflammation that's being pulled out of the joint. That will yeah? So that one that you took off after four or five hours, can you put the same one on? Or do you have to no, that's a very good question. No. When it's fresh produce, you know, you throw it. And because they're poultices, they're drawing, so you, you, you want to throw that away. Yeah? Okay, so after you do the poultices and whatnot, um, can you then apply castor oil over the top of what you've poulticed, yeah. just to help to bring the rest yeah. of it to the skin? Um, so once you've taken the ginger poultice off, then you could put the castor oil on. Yeah. Yes, you could. You certainly could. You could. You, you, you'll get to see what it does. That's why you're the doctor. You'll think, oh, that one felt good. We had a lady with two arthritic joints, and we put ginger on one and potato on the other. <laughs> and the potato is the one I'm going to be looking at next. But before we move on, um, for a person with arthritis, the ginger poultices, they bring incredible relief. One lady said to me, my skin is so hot. I said, yeah, 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 don't worry about that. But what's the joint feel like? And she said, actually, I can move the joint. And we had one guy, and he came to us with a gout in his toe, and he was a barrister, and he was 35, and he said, I've come to the retreat to stop drinking alcohol for a week. He said, don't tell me to stop drinking alcohol. I'm not going to. I'm just here for a week to stop. I said, okay. Well, I actually don't say okay because it's not okay. I just say I'm hearing you. Or I just go, oh. <laughs> anyway, and I always respect everyone's choice. Midweek, we were doing the poultice lecture, and he said to me, oh, he said, can we try that on my little toe? So the toes were like this, except for the middle little toe, it stood up like that. He said, I've got my wig and my barrister clothes on, and I have to wear slippers, and he's only 40. He said, it's so embarrassing, and that toe's been hurting me, he said, for 18 months. He said, oh, see, oh, or I'm hearing you. I said, we'll do a little ginger poultice. So he made a tiny little ginger poultice, wrapped it over, put it on the toe, put some plastic on it, wrapped a bit of leucopore tape on it, and he went to bed. The next morning, we could hear him coming down from his room yelling. Now, this man was really quiet, really quiet, and he's yelling. He said, it's gone, it's gone. 
<laughs> he woke up in the morning and the inflammation had come out of his toe. It was flat and it was no pain. He said, 18 months I have had a painful toe. And he said, overnight, that took all the pain away. And then the next day I did a lecture on the acid-alkaline balance and I showed how alcohol creates a very acid environment, which basically is what gout is. And the next day, we had our final consultation. He said, I'm going to stop alcohol. <laughs> All because of a little ginger poultice. Now, what can also help is turmeric. Now, we have tablets, capsules that we sell at our retreat that are 800 milligrams per capsule. So they're very, very strong. Most people with inflammation don't need more than two capsules a day. So someone with arthritis, go for a more alkaline diet. Take, take uh, turmeric capsules, two or three a day, increase or decrease, it's very, very safe. Very, turmeric's very safe. Drink more water, which helps to alkalize, and put a ginger poultice on for five hours a day. You know, and how many people have suffered from arthritis for years, and yet doing those simple things, they can, can, they can get relief in a matter of hours. Many people are sick through ignorance and not realising that there's no need to suffer when you implement these simple things. So the, the plant, the turmeric, you can buy it <coughs> you can. raw? Is you that can. better than the, the powder? Um, you, the powder and the capsules allow you to take very high dose. It sort of concentrates it. Um, one lady said, I'll put turmeric in all my cooking. I said, well, that's very good, but if you want to take it medicinally, you have to take very high so you, you know, for a teaspoon of turmeric powder, that's probably about two tablespoons of, of fresh turmeric. You see, drying it just concentrates it right there. So you have to eat an enormous amount of fresh turmeric to get the same active sort of in, in the concentrate. Yeah? We have the person with um, arthritis in her neck and yeah. shoulders. Yeah. How would you... So arthritis in the neck and shoulders, um, tomorrow we're going to be doing hydrotherapy, hot and cold compresses, they, they can help a lot. And again, um, the arthritis is usually in the joint, so when you look at neck, it's probably the spine, or it might be the, the bones around here. And again, necessity is the mother of invention. If you put a poultice there, you can often bandage it under your arm and around here so it's just working out how you can do that. Um, very good for lower back pain is the ginger compresses. One lady had a very sore lower back and she put a hot water bottle on it and that brought relief because whenever you're in pain the muscles tend to tighten and cramp but the hot water bottle can actually increase the inflammation. So. She, I advised a ginger poultice. Now the ginger poultice on the back, she laid on her back and you know, we ladies have curves in our back, so if a lady lies on her back with her knees up, it means the lower back is flat straight on the poultice. And she said within half an hour could she, she could feel the heat, <laughs> the heat uh, in the area pulling the inflammation out of the painful lower joint on her lower back. Now the heat from that ginger poultice did the same thing as the hot water bottle to the tight cramping muscle. So isn't that interesting? So the hot water bottle will relieve the tight cramping muscles but increase the inflammation, whereas the ginger poultice will relieve the inflammation, inflammation and also relax the tight, tight muscles. Yeah. What about um, emphysemia? That's something with that. Emphysemia is. Um, is a destruction of little alveoli in the lungs. And once the alveoli is dead, it's gone. So with emphysema, um, those alveoli cannot be replaced. But you can strengthen what remains. So then the question mark has to be asked. How did the emphysema happen? Not in every case, but in the majority of cases, it's usually smoking. So then you check, has, has the person stopped smoking? Or if they're living with someone that smokes, um, my auntie died from lung cancer and she never smoked, but her husband smoked in her life. So, you know, getting away from that environment and strengthening what remains, making sure they're only breathing in pure air 
and uh, the castoral compresses can certainly help penetrate and break up any scar tissue that is in there. But also, um, working those lungs, so your high intensity exercise program, swimming or uh, exercise bike or the lymphocyte. So you can strengthen what remains. The next thing we're going to look at is the potato. Whereas the ginger is for joint inflammation, the potato is for tissue inflammation. So we're going to make a potato poultice now. Now let's say I wanted to make this ginger poultice up early. I would just fold it over like that and I could put it in a little bag and use it in a few hours. But as, as I just said, if it has been used, you must throw it away. So now we're going to, we're going to pretend that Jeremy's just sprained his wrist. Jeremy and I were whizzing around on the little scooters in the, in the garage this morning. And let's say Jeremy crashed into the dog and came down on his wrist and he sprained his ankle. So, wrist. So, um, he's got tissue inflammation there now. So we'll make a ginger pot. Sorry, potato pot. So you grab up the potato. Now be very careful not to grate up too much potato. There's nothing worse than a leaking poultice. Because Jeremy only has a little wrist, I'm going to make a little poultice. Now you see I've just done about that much. Now if it was for my six foot six brother-in-law, who's very, very big, maybe I'll do twice that amount. So you adjust it accordingly. And see how I've got a lot more cloth there. But that cloth's important to make your package, because there's nothing worse than leaking poultices. But it also allows you've got somewhere to take up any excess fluid that might be coming out. So there's the potato poultice. And thank you, Jeremy, if you could come up. And then you are, and I'm not going to bandage it because it takes too long. But that's um, depending on where it is. Now let's say Jeremy, Jeremy's wrist is very swollen, and it's just swollen there. Can you see how you do far more than where the swollen area is? Again, you make sure that that plastic covers it properly, and bandage it around. How long would you leave that on for? You could leave it on all night, or you could leave it on. Um, off, um, you can go now. Thank you, Jeremy. And again, you can make it up and just fold it over like that and use it in an hour. I probably wouldn't make it and then use it the next day, but um, you can make it a little bit beforehand if that's convenient. So you would use it on a sprained ankle, you would use it on a um, sprained knee, you would use it wherever you've got tissue inflammation. Bruising? Pardon? Bruising? Bruising, yep. yep. How many days would you use it for? As long as it's still sore or just... As long as it takes, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, the, you're, the body's reaction will tell you. My son... His little boy trod on a rusty nail, and the rusty nail went right up into his foot. He was three, and had a little crock on, and the little boys want to be around the men on the job side. There's nails there. And Michael, well, my daughter-in-law went to Michael, and she and he said, "Take him to Grandma." And I was at home, and she brought him in, and he was crying, and he was covered in dirt. Was where the boys play in the dirt. So what's the first thing you do? It's just common sense. Gave him a bath. The warm water will calm him down. And you know what you do? You always smile. Because you know what a smile says to a child? Everything's all right. Even if you're terrified, you smile, okay? Just act, you can. And um, I washed him. I made a grated potato poultice. And I put it on the bottom of his foot. 
and then I bandaged it up and then I put a sock on and I asked God to bless it. Now, we have a situation here of possible tetanus, am I right? Now, tetanus is carried by horses. So tetanus is common wherever horses are. Tetanus can only get a hold on the body with a wound that is deep and has healed on the outside. So we've got all the environment for tetanus and my grandson hasn't been vaccinated. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to put, give that foot all the conditions so that tetanus cannot get a hold on that little body. So we put a grated potato poultice on it and then oh, three hours later, it's evening, take it off, have a bath, no swelling and no soreness. What's the body saying? You see that? And the wound is open. It must be open. It must not close until it's healed from the inside. Next day, they just put little socks and shoes on him and he ran around all day. And then that night, at the end of the day, it was starting to look a little swollen. So they gave him a hot bath and put a grated potato poultice on him overnight. In the morning, no swelling at all, no soreness at all. Now, this happened for three nights. On the fourth day, he ran around all day, end of the day, no swelling, no soreness. What's the body saying? We're right now. So he only did three nights of greater potato problems. The potato <laughs> would pull, and it pulled um, out of the sore. Now, my son William, after the third night, he said, Mum, look at this. And he took the poultice, and he'd made it out of one of those chucks. He said, have a look at the top of this poultice. There was little shavings of fluorescent blue metal. The poultice had pulled the rusty metal out of his foot and cleaned up the metal. So, and then we didn't do anything else because there was no need. If after a day or two his foot gets sore, what's the body saying? Excuse me, I need, I need a little bit of help. See, that's why the, the, the body will speak. A lady rang me up and she said, my daughter's just trodden on a rusty nail and it almost went through the top of her foot. She's 10. We're doing a grain of potato, but it's still a little bit sore and it's a little bit inflamed. So I said, do hot and cold. And we'll look at these tomorrow, but I'll just cover it now briefly. I said, get two buckets. Make one hot. And tomorrow I'll actually tell you the science behind this. So hot for three minutes, and then cold for 30 seconds. You do that three times. You see, initially hot is a stimulant, and then after three minutes, everything starts to, to slow down. That's why I feel like falling asleep in a hot bath. But before it's got time to slow down, you put it in the cold, and I know the cold has ice cubes in it. Will that wake up the foot? <coughs> oh, yes. It's a stimulant, but it only takes 30 seconds before it starts to depress, so you take it out of the cold and put it back to the hot. Wakes it up again. Can you see what you're doing? Wake up, wake up. And what you're doing is you're causing massive amounts of blood to go into the area. And when new blood goes into the area, the old blood is pushed out. It's hydrotherapy. And what does the blood contain? Red blood cells, which carry the oxygen, the nutrients, the water. White blood cells, which are your internal army to fight. So I said, I want you to do hot and cold three times on her foot. How long will that take? 15 minutes at the most. And I said, and ring me back in two hours and tell me what's happening. And after the hot and cold, then she put the grated potato powder on, poultice on. She rang me back and she said, the, uh, she said, all the swelling's gone down and there is no more tenderness. What's the body say? If she rang me back and she said, it's still very tender and sore, uh, because I'm not sure what's happening, I just say, take the child Do you know, I've actually never got to that because it always works. One, one man was brought to me when I was in the rainforest, he'd been sickling with a sickle, barefoot. What happens next? Ooh. The sickle went into, the, into his heel. And it had happened three days before, and his foot was up like a big red balloon, and there was a red line going up his leg. And he was lying in bed, he was a hippie, smoking marijuana, waiting for nature to heal. 
Nature will heal if you give it the right conditions. Unfortunately, his body was screaming at him with the pain and the marijuana was just blocking it. Can you see how that can be dangerous? And there are times when I think painkillers are necessary and there are times when painkillers can be dangerous because they're stopping your body telling you if there's pain and where it is. So I did hot and cold. Now he could not handle it very hot, so the first one was warm. And after being in the ice cold, he could handle a little bit hotter. See, in an injury, the, ten, the, the blood tends to sit and pool in the area. And what this does, the hot and colds, they pull massive amounts of blood into the area, which push the old blood out and bring in new supplies. Then I put a huge grated potato poultice over his foot, wrapped it up. His pain had reduced by 50%. That's quicker than Panadol. <laughs> and as I'll show you tomorrow, hydrotherapy <coughs> has been used for centuries and in the area of pain relief, it's without it. He could even walk now. They carried him to me. We did this about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, come back at 6 o'clock, and we did the whole thing again. And the, lo the line had gone down a little bit, but the swelling of the foot had gone down by a third. We did hot and colds again. We did grated potato overnight. He came in the morning, and the red line had gone down by about a foot and a half. It had gone back down to about his knee now, and the foot was back to a normal size, and the wound was oozing. That's what. You see, that was a perfect environment for tetanus. The wound had healed on the outside, and it wasn't allowed to ooze on the inside. It was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, if I hadn't had response from him, if the pain hadn't reduced, and the foot hadn't gone down, and the red line hadn't gone down, we're taking him straight to the hospital. So you watch. You're watching for the body's response. And sometimes the body will go, yes, and sometimes the body will say, no. One lady said, I've tried hot and cold, and it didn't work. I said, how often did you try it? The more serious it is, you do it too early. You, you just do it more. You just do it more. And then you've also got to check that the person's drinking enough water. They've stopped their Coca-Cola. They've stopped their cigarettes. They've stopped their alcohol. But he, I've even treated people who are drinking alcohol, Coke, and cigarettes, and it still works. <laughs> Ideally. Ideally, we don't. So the potato, uh, very good for all your tissue inflammation and your ginger for joint inflammation. Yes? So if it's like on the foot, you put the, the foot in hot water and then cold water. Mm -hmm. If it's anywhere else in the body, can you use like towels? Yeah, and tomorrow we'll demo that. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. You can actually sit in it. You put elbows and hands in it, feet in it. For anyone else, you can do compresses. And I've got a, um, a body that has agreed for me to do all these hot and colds too, so you'll be able to gather around and see how we do it. And what about <laughs> gastric problems like um, uh, reflux? And mm -hmm. Whatever you want, can you use um, With reflux, uh, it's usually the little cardiac sphincter. Mm -hmm. It's open. And it's a muscle. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. And magnesium relaxes. So taking magnesium will relax and close that muscle. And what's also important for reflux is to eat breakfast like a kid, lunch like a queen, and not eat at night. A lot of people get reflux because of a large evening meal, and when they lie down, gravity causes the food to press up against the, um, the, the little muscle. So an evening, a light evening meal, would, the best would be just a bowl of soup or a vegetable juice. That's a light evening meal. For someone who's, the reflux has come up into their esophagus and causing um, ulceration, slippery on, can coat and soothe and heal the line of that. So they take magnesium and slippery on before they go to bed. Everyone that comes to Misty Mountain with reflux goes home without it. We only serve uh, thin soup. There are foods definitely that can cause irritation, and usually the body will let the person know. Unfortunately, um, 
the medication blocks all the symptoms and the person doesn't know what food works and what food doesn't.